when you're ready. Well, thank you. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Okay. So each morning we wake up and pose an elemental question. What am I going to wear? Much thought goes into that decision. How do I feel? What's the weather? How do I, what do I have to do today? What do I want to say? What do I want to project? Clothes are our initial and most basic tool of communication. They convey our social status, our economic status, our occupation, our ambition, our self-worth. They empower us with, and imbue us with sensuality. They can reveal or respect our they can reveal our respect or our disregard for convention. Vain trifles, as they may seem, clothes change our view of the world and the world's view of us, Virginia wrote, Wolf wrote in Orlando. Every day, billions of people buy clothes with nary a thought about the consequences of those purchases. Shoppers snap up five times more clothing now than they did in 1980. In 2018, that averaged 68 garments a year. As a whole, the world's citizens acquire 80 billion apparel items annually. And on average, each piece will be worn seven times before getting tossed. In China, it's reportedly three times. And if the global population swells to 8.5 billion by 2030, and the GDP per capita rises by 2% in developed nations and 4% in developing economies in those intervening years, and we don't change our consumption habits, we will buy 63% more fashion from 62 million tons to 102 million tons. All of this is by design. In airports, you can pick up an entire war new, new wardrobe on the way to the gate. In Tokyo, you can score a tailored cert, suit from a vending machine. Love that outfit on Instagram, click, click, and it's yours. Walk into a fashion store, the techno thumps, surfaces gleam, the light is desert sharp. All the better for you to see all that is for sale. Prices, strangely, become moot. You're so beguiled and so overstimulated that you forget to cons consider such fundamentals as quality. You spend freely, recklessly even, and though you feel like you've been, you, you, though you've probably been rooked, you feel like you've won. And none of this is sustainable, none of it. Since the invention of the mechanical loom nearly two and a half centuries ago, fashion has been a dirty and unscrupulous business ex that exploited humans and earth alike to harvest bountiful profits. Slavery, child labor, and prison labor have all been integral parts of the supply chain at one time or another. I mean, think about Oliver Twist. And the same goes for today. And on occasion, society has righted those wrongs through legislation and labor union pressure. But trade deals and globalization and greed undercut all of those good works. Trade, up until the 1970s, the United States produced 70%, 70% of the apparel that Americans purchased. And thanks to the New Deal for much of the 20th century, brands and manufacturers were expected to adhere to national strict labor laws. In the late 1980s, a new segment of apparel cropped up, fast fashion. And with it, you know, the production of trendy and inexpensive garments in vast amounts at lightning speed in subcontracted factories to be hawked at thousands of chain stores. Fast fashion gets its design ideas from the catwalk. Fashion's top designers spend months and months developing a collection, choosing fabrics, creating prints, coming up with silhouettes, conducting fittings. Some of the books are pre-sold to retailers in showrooms before appointments. The last are presented in the cat, 
during catwalk fashion weeks, fashion weeks catwalks and critiqued by the world's press. Before the reviews are posted, shows upload those images and video clips on social media, often live. And fast fashion designs peruse those images and note the number of likes. A free, an instantaneous and free market study and choose which ones they want to steal, loosely reinterpret and produce offshore for pennies a piece. I walked out of a show in London last year on a top, and a top online retail executive mused to me, I bet Tot Shop is already working on that butterfly print. To keep the prices low, Fashion brands have slashed manufacturing costs, and the cheapest labor was available in the world's poorest countries. Offshore, offshoring caught on almost all across the industry, just as globalization was unfurling. And though it started in a small corner of the business, fast fashion's astounding success was so enviable that it soon reset the rhythm for how clothing, from luxury wear to athletic wear, was conceived, advertised, and sold. The impact was dramatic. In the last 30 years, <laughs> fashion has grown from $500 billion trade, primarily of domestically produced clothes, to a $2.4 trillion global behemoth. The fallout has been great. First was the hit to labor in developed economies. In 1991, 56.2% of all clothes purchased in the United States were American made. By 2012, it was down to 2.5%. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, between 1990 and 2012, the US textile and garment industry lost more than three fourths of the sector's labor force, siphoned to Latin America and Asia. Once vibrant industrial centers up and down the Eastern seaboard, and across the South faded to ghost towns as factories sat empty and those who were laid off went on unemployment. In the United Kingdom in the 1980s, 1 million worked in the US textile industry. Now only 100,000 do. The same went down across most of Western Europe. All the while, apparel and textile jobs globally nearly doubled. The reason was simple. According to a 2016 poll, when given the choice between buying $50 pair of pants made offshore or an $85 pair made in the US, 67% of the respondents said they'd go for the cheaper ones. The response was the same, even if their annual ho household income was more than $100,000. Fast fashion revolution has been grossly lucrative for the entire industry. Five of the world's 55 richest individuals were fashion company owners in 2018. And that's not counting the three Waltons of Walmart. The second casualty of fast fashion has been human rights. In developing nations, fashion employs one out of six people on the globe, making it the most labor intensive industry out there, more than agriculture, more than defense, more than Fewer than 2% of them earn a living wage. Most apparel workers are women, and some are boys and girls. In 2016, H&M, Next, and Esprit were found to have Syrian refugee children sewing and hauling bundles of clothes in subcontracted workshops in Turkey. The brand was reportedly since, has since rectified the situation. Some factories are so shoddy, they catch fire. This one is Tazreen, the one where more than 100 people died in Bangladesh. And sometimes worse, they collapse, like in Rana Plaza six years ago. More than 1,000 people died then. The third victim of, of this expansion, this, this wave of, of fast fashion and, and apparel explosion, has been Earth. Fashion, speed, and greed has eviscerated the environment in all ways. The World Bank estimates that the sector is responsible for nearly 20% of all industrial water pollution annually. It releases 10% of all carbon emissions in our air. 
One kilogram of cloth generates 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases. The creation of one cotton t-shirt requires a third of a pound of lab concocted fertilizers and 23.3 kilowatts of electricity. And it can take up to 2,700 liters of water to grow, one grow the cotton for one shirt. Synthetic fibers release microfibers into the water when washed, both at mills and at home. Up to 40% enter our rivers, lakes, and oceans and are ingested by fish, worm their way up the food chain to humans. In 2016, nearly 90% of 2,000 fresh and seawater samples tested by the Global Microfibers Initiative contained microfibers. With of more than 100 billion items of clothing produced each year, 20% go unsold, the detritus of economies of scale. Leftovers are usually buried, shredded, or incinerated as Burberry embarrassingly admitted in 2018. In the last 20 years, the volume of clothes Americans throw away has doubled from 7 million to 14 million tons. That equals 80 pounds per person per year. The Environmental Protection Agency reported that Americans sent 10.5 million tons of textiles, the majority of which were clothes, to landfill in 2015. The EPA during the Trump administration has not updated that figure. Most clothing contains synthetics and most synthetics are not biodegradable. The history of the rag trade is dark, but not completely so. There was a mid-century moment when the garment industry did something right, when people knew those who cut and sewed their clothes. They lived and worked in close proximity they were our neighbors. They, we went to school with their kids. You had an uncle in the garment trade. But there were injustices to be sure, but not to the degree of today because consumers couldn't turn a blind eye because we knew some of these people because it was just down the road. That is no longer the case. We imagine ourselves more learned, more egalitarian, more humane than our predecessors, more woke, that by procuring $5 tees and $20 jeans by the sackful, we aren't causing grievous harm. We might even be creating good jobs on the other side of the world for those in need. Having visited many of those offshore factories and spoken with dozens of workers, I can assure you this is not the case. But during my reporting, I also found reasons to be hopeful. Through Herculean efforts by brave advocates, creators, entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors, and retailers, and the unfeigned demands of a rising generation of conscientious consumers, the apparel industry is being forced to veer towards a more principled value system. Visionaries and throughout the world are recasting the business model with hyper-localism in rural areas like the American South. A return to smarter manufacturing in New York, Los Angeles, and across Europe. A cleaner denim process from cotton fields to finishing plants. A holistic approach to luxury that will trickle down from the Paris runway to online resellers. Scientific breakthroughs that are creating truly circular fabrics technological advances that will completely change how apparel is made. The total and rapid rethinking of how we buy what we wear. Like London-based designer Stella McCartney, who is a leader of the conscious fashion movement, clothes that in her case are animal free and sustainable as possible. Or Tennessee farmer Sarah Bellows, who is jump-starting the natural indigo business. There she is with indigo plants in Tennessee. Or Gina Logia of Valencia, Spain, which has invented a greener way to distress denim on the mass level using lasers and as little as one glass of water per pair of jeans. Through their efforts, though their efforts are born out of concern for the planet, they are also proving that sustainable fashion practices 
are better for the bottom line. More than a decade ago, the slow food and organic movement prodded us to be more informed about what we eat and to contemplate the consequences of alimentary industrialization. The same has not happened broadly in fashion yet. As it was with the sustainable food crusade, however, fashion change makers are striving to bring sourcing and producing back to a human scale. Many workers are, are working toward a vertically integrated system to keep the entire process in one location and avoid the troubles that come with a global and opaque supply chain. We as consumers play a pivotal part. Like with food, we can start reading clothing labels and consider where and how our items are made before purchasing them. For what we already own, we can wash less, repair more, and consider resale. We can give our wardrobe a longer life. It's time to quit, work, quit the mindless shopping and consider what we are doing culturally and spiritually. To fan that change, we need to understand how we got to this point. And when we ask ourselves, what am I going to wear today? We should be able to answer knowledgeably and with a dash of pride. We have been casual about our clothes. It's time to get dressed with intention. Thank you. Q&A, there we are. Yes. Could you please provide the source of your statistics you are quoting? Well, they come from all over the place and they're all footnoted in my book in the end notes, but they come from places like McKinsey and the World Bank and the MacArthur Circular, Circular Fashion Foundation in the Isle of Wight and uh, the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Fashion Summit. So the next question was, thanks for the great talk. Do you think that the fashion industry needs more sustainable brands to be created or should current non-sustainable brands just change their business models? With new sustainable brands, I mean, do we need more people creating new brands instead of focusing on the current ones? Well, I think we need both. It's a lot like the fashion of the food industry, as I was saying before. We needed big brands to be more organic, and then we needed the rise of farm to table restaurants and small farms, organic farms and farmers markets. And I think we're having a bit of the same in the fashion industry now. Since my book has come out, I have found that there are a lot of small brands out there that nobody's heard of, but they're sending me emails saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here, doing really good works. There was one I heard about called Wear Packed in Boulder, Colorado. There's another one, um, a friend of mine in Florida started a handbag company. They're, they're all over the place and jeans companies and denim companies and t-shirt companies, organic. Um, it's all happening. At the same time, yes, the big companies need to rethink their model. And that's what Caring has done when it, it, it signed, you know, it launched this pact in September with Emmanuel Macron at the, um, at the summit in, in Biarritz. And there's dozens and dozens of brands who have joined on and said, we're going to do this too, to try to hit these, these points that have been negotiated through COP, the COP meetings and try to become zero waste and carbon neutral. And, um, and that's what Stella McCartney has done now by joining LVMH. And I think she's going to try to steer that magnificently large fashion group of more than 70 brands to be more sustainable, just as she helped push that through at Caring, championed it. She is a champion of sustainability and conscious fashion. And now she, her brand is part of the largest luxury brands group in the world. So maybe they'll start changing their, the way they do business too. So I think we need a bit of both. We need like in the food industry, we got farm to table and, and farmer's markets, and then we have Whole Foods. So we can do both. So I have another question here. What advice would you give to luxury fashion retailers? Ah, this is a tricky question. Um, I would say just, you know, be as transparent for your customers as possible. That if you know something is made of organic cotton, say, hey, you know, this is made of organic cotton. Maybe put a corner of your boutiques or your, or your stores uh, aside so they could 
you know, mark it off and say, this is a sustainable corner where we, we know the, trace, the traceability of the supply chain is really clear and that we know that the wool is coming from a, you know, a farm in New Zealand where the treat, sheep are treated well or the, or the cotton is organic or the dyes are organic or the workers were, you know, they're fair trade, that they were paid a living wage or better and that they have benefits and they live, work in safe environments. All those things are important. And I think if you just flag it, for consumers, they will appreciate it. And you'll see a change in the industry at the same time because these good works will be applauded. And another question, what is your take on the denim industry? Ah, and what types of solutions do denim brands have to create a new, new business models? Well, I write a whole chapter about this in my book. Denim, you know, is blue jeans at any given minute, uh, moment of the day, half the world is wearing blue jeans which is kind of a crazy figure if you think about it. And yet, when you find yourself standing on a street corner, you'll see like half the people there are wearing jeans, maybe more. You're on the bus, you're in a class, you're standing in line at the grocery store. Jeans, 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 jeans. So jeans, since jeans were the most sustainable clothing item ever invented originally, you know, those rivets, and the seams were to hold them, you know, to make the, hold them together longer so they'd last longer, that they were made of this sturdy fabric. Denim was then a very sturdy fabric. It's only been in the last 30 years or so that this idea that jeans were durable, sustainable, that you wore them forever and ever, and then you turn them into cutoffs yourself and where you pass them down. It's only been in the last 30 years that that's changed with the advent of, of what we call finishing in the business or you know, with pre-washing and acid washing and stone washing and rasping and, and distressing. Before you did that your own. I mean, when I was a teenager, we bought jeans that were so stiff you couldn't sit down in them comfortably for six months um, because, yeah, and then, and then they got really great. So because that, all that industrial washing and distressing is a very polluting industry and, and also not very great for workers as I saw myself in Ho Chi Minh City and I write about it in the book. Uh, they you know work without masks, they inhale all this dust, they're working in synthetic indigo which is a, has very toxic chemicals in it. So the good news is we have women like Sarah Bellows who I mentioned and I had that lovely picture of her growing indigo in Tennessee and she's launching a movement towards the industrial uh, growing natural indigo on an industrial scale. One of her first clients was Cone Denim it still is. She works with Patagonia too. And, um, and she, uh, she's just really pushing this through. She said she hoped to get 1% of the denim industry when I first met with her in 2016. And by 2018, she said, well, maybe I'll get 3%. And if she gets 3% and she inspires everybody else, she, uh, she will have made a difference and the denim industry will be cleaner. So, what advice would you give to an independent startup fashion brand? Hmm. Well, I'm not really, a, I'm, you know, I'm a writer and a journalist. I'm not really a, a consultant, a business consultant. So that's not my, up my street, except to say, you know, be as sustainable as possible and, and always be very open and clear with your consumers. And aim for zero waste if you can, because it just makes better business sense. You know, if you're not wasting things, then you're saving money. And, um, and direct to consumer is, is one of the ways to, to do that, made to order and direct consumer, because then you're not producing things that you don't need to produce and you're not having to destroy leftover stock. Those are sort of the things I learned while talking to different people in the business. And the, 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 that seemed to be the most effective new business model, taking the old way of doing things like a, tailor or a dressmaker and combining it with the digital age where you can com you can communicate like we are directly through the internet and make to order so i would i would start with those ideas there i think if you read the book you'll see i i talk to a lot and i profile a lot of independent fashion designers and fashion companies and and show what's working and what's not working and you might be able to figure out what's best for you that way now What's your opinion on real fur versus faux fur? Or real fur, yeah, real fur versus faux fur. Uh, well, 
I'm not really great, you know, keen on fur to begin with. Um, and I'm not really keen on synthetic fur because we know it's made of petroleum. But Stella McCartney has been working hard on trying to come up with a greener version of fake fur. And I believe she just introduced it in September. And I don't know much about it, but maybe this is an alternative. You know, if you live in the Arctic and it's, and it's unbelievably cold, it completely makes sense to wear fur. But at the same time, we've come up with some pretty cool alternatives to that. If we can shy away from polyester or petroleum-based uh, fabrics all around, it would be better for the planet because, you know, polyester is basically plastic and it never biodegrades. It's like Ziploc bags and plastic straws and all the rest of it. So, you know, all in all, maybe we should just sort of skip the whole fur discussion and find something else to use. Okay. Uh, what is your take on green consumers in Asia Chinese consumers? Are they conscious consumers? I don't know. Because I haven't been to China in a while. I was in Hong Kong on this trip and I didn't spend a lot of time there. I only spent like two days. So um, it's hard to say. I'd have to go really root around and dig to, to know firsthand. I do know that, that this figure that I got from the fellow who owns and runs Y Closet was that the average Chinese consumer or the average garment in China is worn three times before it's thrown away. That was a study they did when they were doing research on how to launch their company. And that's very disconcerting if it's average. But, you know, in the West, in the United States and in, in Britain, it's seven times. So we aren't, a, you know, we aren't much, much better. And I'm wearing a jacket right now that I've had for 15 years and I've worn so much that I've had to, there's a hole in the pocket. So, and the lining's gone. So if I'm wearing this, this long, then there's a lot that's going unworn and just tossed directly. And that I find most absurd, upsetting of all. And does the book discuss future systems shifts or mostly the legacy of problems? Ah, no, that's where the future of fashion comes in. The future of fashion. The book is set up in a way, I think um, you'll really like. It's uh, set up like Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And I have the ghost of fashion past, the ghost of fashion present, and the ghost of fashion future. And of course, the ghost of fashion past, like in Dickens' Ghost of Christmas Past, is awful, terrible, terrible, terrible. It's just depressing. And when you read this, you go like, this is the most depressing book. But it's not. Because then we have the ghost of pres fashion present, where you find all these cool makers and, and change makers and craftsmen doing really great stuff. And they're really, you know, do, going back to the old way, like I said, but merging it with digital. And we have, that's where I talk about natural indigo, where I talk about Natalie Channon of Alabama Channon using organic cotton, direct to consumer, zero waste. Really cool. Maria Cornejo in New York, sourcing everything in New York and keeping the garment district going. And, and you know, doing everything within a 20 block radius of her, of her headquarters. So there's the, the ghost of fashion present is good. But then we have the ghost of fashion future and fashion future is going to be great because it is uh, about 3D printing. And there's talk that we're all going to have 3D printers at home and someday we'll be able to print our own clothes. And, and we'll just buy links on Amazon and print everything at home. Isn't that a crazy idea? And, um, and SoBots, I talk about SoBots, the good of SoBots, the bad of SoBots, AI. And, um, and, you know, where, what is retail going to do? How is retail, is we going to have a retail apocalypse like we're having in the media and like we've had in all sorts of different areas? Will they have to rethink their entire existence, the bricks and mortar? And how will they come up with a new vision? I've got all sorts of cool people doing cool things, growing, growing leather in labs and growing silk in Silicon Valley in labs and, Lots of really interesting things I think you'll find very cool. Some of it's a little space agey, some of it may never happen, but it's cool to dream, right? Okay, and now we have, do you have any advice for families that rely on the cheap cost of fast fashion to dress their families because that is what they can afford 
and what they have access to? Well, this is a very good question because, you know, I'm, I'm talking live from Paris in France, a socialist country. So we have, you know, we think about these things here a lot. Sorry, I can have some water. And here's, here's what we have, I talk about. I was told several times while I was working on this book that clothes have never been cheaper today they are, than they are today. And I kept going like, what does this mean? And then I started thinking, right, well, what my daughter pays, she's 19, that's who came in with the dog. Uh, what she pays for clothes at fast fashion shops is less than I was paying at her age in the department stores outside of Philadelphia where I grew up at Bamberger's and Wanamaker's and Strawbridge and Clothier. And when, and I was using my babysitting money to buy it and I was making a dollar an hour. And she babysits and she makes 15 euros an hour. And she comes home with sackfuls of clothes when I would get one or two things. Or I would put things on layaway. Do we even remember what layaway is? Where you put it, you, you basically got a mortgage on a garment. If, I remember I bought a jacket that way. It cost $100. And I put on layaway and I took my babysitting money and I kept going into the store and paying it off every few weeks. At a dollar an hour, it meant that I had to babysit those brats for a hundred hours to buy that coat. But I did, and it was worth it. And I saved and I worked hard for it. And you know what? 40 years later, that coat is in my coat closet at the other, on the other side of that door. So what really sort of came, you know, put this all in focus for me was I read a piece in The New Yorker written in 1940 about the price of clothes in the early the late 20s and the early 30s during the depression. And luxury fashion at the time ran between 800 and $3,000, basically the same you pay at Dior or Gucci or any other major luxury product, right? And off the peg ready to wear, the equivalent of, you know, H&M and Zara today was $20, $20, basically what you pay today. And that was at the height of the depression. Now, if we stop to think about how much money we made then versus how much we make now, and we stop to think about how much a loaf of bread costs then, or a gallon of gasoline, or even a house compared to now, it really does put in perspective how little we pay for clothes and therefore why we buy six times, five times more than we did 20 years ago. Think about how small closets were before the war. If you have an old house or an old apartment, I live in an old apartment in Paris, our closets are, you know, we don't even have closets. <laughs> they had wardrobes and they weren't terribly big. And those were dresses with bustles that we had to stuff, that they were stuffing in there with all the petticoats and everything going on underneath. That's, so while I say it's hard to imagine, you know, I don't want to talk down to people saying, well, you don't have much money, so you shouldn't be able to buy clothes. But what we should do is not buy 10 at 100 but buy one at a hundred and keep it and wear it till it starts looking like that. Um, I feel like we now don't, because we burn through clothes so quickly that Friday night comes around and you're like, oh, I think I'm gonna go get a new dress because I'm going to a cocktail party instead of shopping our closet or shopping our friend's closet or shopping, you know, my daughter wears some of my clothes. She's wearing my old jeans that she found in the back of the closet. The old ones that were too stiff to, to sit down in for six months. They lasted. And, you know, or rent, or as Cecilia McCartney said, if you can't buy it on the first time around, buy it on the sale, buy it on the sale, the sale, buy it on resale, rent it. There are lots of options, but I would say basically buy better. Don't buy more, just buy, buy well, buy better, and buy quality that will last. And buy, and the French women are known for having a very small wardrobe, very full of basics, and then dressing things up with scarves and jewelry. There's something really smart to that. And, it, and it's smart in many ways because we're not overstuffing our closets. We're not running up bills at the dry cleaners. We're not killing our credit cards, buying stuff we don't need and we wear seven times before we throw them away. If you invest in it, you'll wear it longer. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.